Good morning, everyone. It's, it, it's a pleasure, it's an honor to be here with you, and um, not only for GW, but I think for the Central Asian Studies community, this, this event has become really a landmark and a place to catch up and, and get a, a great analytical and scholarly uh, take on trends, and so I think we really have to commend Marlene for everything that she's done for the program, and especially for, for bringing this that greatly enriches our communities. Um, shamelessly, this presentation is bound up in a new book that's just out. Uh, just uh, my co-author, John Heather Shaw of the University of Exeter. Uh, originally, the title of this book, uh, or the subtitle, that was rather Power and Money in and Out of Central Asia. Yale didn't like it, it was too clunky, but I thought that was the key part <laughs> of actually the argument. And of course, I lost. Um, so, the idea behind this whole project, and it builds upon the special issue Central Asian survey that we edited called Offshore Central Asia, is to look at Central Asia's extraterritorial and global connections, right? Both in the realms of politics and political contestation, how political contestation takes place in external spaces that we might not normally think are contested, um, or types of political uh, uh, challenges, um, UK courtrooms, uh, arbitration hearings, um, the use of Interpol red notices, uh, and uh, so forth. So we do this through the prism of trying to sort of confront what we see three myths of Central Asian politics, especially in the way certain scholars and policy analysts approach the region. And I realize coming out of DC is a very dangerous task to do. Um, but I'll, I'll try and take it on. The first is the myth of global isolation and lack of connectivity. What we argue instead is that Central Asia is highly globalized in many different ways. It's just a different kind of globalization uh, than the kind that we normally think about. The myth of partial or incomplete liberalization and reform and the myth of local traditionalism. This is a very elite-centered presentation. I just want to say that. So I think you know some of the other presenters in sort of Marlene's world work, uh, you know, you'll get the other part of that, you know, the social changes, international changes, and so forth, but this project is very much centered on elites in the region. So, for many years now, uh, I've heard a lot of this word, um, connectivity, right, that the, the thing that is ailing Central Asia is the lack of connections, the lack of connectivity, both within the region and to the greater global economy. This is um, a feature not only of sort of U.S. assumptions, but also Chinese assumptions about the region, right? Promoting connectivity mostly in the form of new trade and infrastructure routes will unleash developmental uh, potential uh, across the region. And to me, the term is deeply misleading for a couple of reasons. One is actually underestimates the real connections that we already have and have had for some time that form a very peculiar type of state formation in Central Asia. Uh, and then two, I'd actually think it mischaracterizes Central Asia's development's challenges, right? Uh, the main problem confronting Central Asia uh, isn't lack of connectivity, it's kleptocracy and capital, right? Those are the two main sort of structural obstacles. Uh, and those are actually not going to be uh, uh, enhanced by sort of greater high-speed rails or whatsoever. In fact, you can make a case they might be worse. So in some ways, I put this chart up, a lot of presentations I give just to give you a sense that in Central Asia's informal trade barriers are very high, extremely high. These are import-export times, according to data, collected by the ease of doing business. Um, you can find an earlier version of this in my 2012 book. Um, so it's very laborious to transit goods in and out of Central Asia. And you see only minimal improvements, maybe with the exception of export times in these Pakistan goods. Here are the comparable regions, right? So if you're starting a new Silk Road, Central Asia is probably the last place in the world you'd want to do it, right? Given that East European, Latin American, Middle Eastern, and South Asian times are all significantly uh, uh, less fractions of um, what sort of Central Asian formal trade barrier times are. But all this has taken place, this kind of, you know, this persistence of sort of import barriers at a time in which actually Central Asian trade itself is globalized. So you have this sort of strange dimension that actual trade volumes, value of trade with China especially, and with Russia, exploded during the 2000s, but this did not lead to actual reduction of informal types of trade barriers. 
Um, and this is you know, my favorite statistic here. China in 2001 accounted for about a billion dollars worth of business. 2001, not 1991. 2001. And then in 2010, it had exploded over 30. Probably the number is sort of closer to 50. So in that sense, Central Asia is becoming greatly connected. Um, we can talk about, oops, this one didn't. Uh, translate um, Central Asia as a global leader in remittance dependence, right? So Tajikistan is always at the top in terms of GDP, remittance income per GDP. Kyrgyzstan is second or third. Um, we can talk about capital flight as an indicator of globalization. According to the IMF, capital flight in Tajikistan was 65% of GDP. This is unheard of. This is an obscene statistic. Right back in the 90s in Russia, this was estimated at 10 to 15 percent, and that was the age that we talked about the Russian virtual economy and everything sort of leaving sort of offshore. Nothing stays in place in Tajikistan. We can talk about the global connections of the Asia Universal Bank in Kyrgyzstan under then President Kurmanbek Bekiev, that became, by all intents and purposes, a global money laundering uh, hub, about doing about a trillion dollars uh, worth of shell company transactions. So Central Asia is globalized. It's just globalized selectively, and it's globalized in areas that we don't normally uh, think about. Uh, the myth of partial liberalization. This is often posited as, again, um, a real problem in sort of Central Asia's development, that you know, Central Asian rulers haven't performed enough reforms. And in certain cases, this is absolutely true. You still have two uh, countries in Turkmenistan and Uzbekistan that have closed capital accounts, right? Lack of currency convertibility. Maybe this is going to change in Uzbekistan. Um, so you have, uh, uh, you know, you certainly have that in certain cases, but in other areas, Central Asia is actually uh, very highly liberalized and, in fact, unregulated. Um, actually, I'm not sure what these are coming out on the translate here. Um, I was going to show you Kazakhstan and its top origins, destination, direct uh, foreign investment. The slide would have shown that the Netherlands is actually the leading source of FDI and outflows in Kazakhstan, about 40%. Now you might say, wow, the Dutch are 40%, uh, uh, respond 40% investment in Kazakhstan. Um, that's, you know, that's really wonderful. You know, what, do they, what do they sell or make? And the point is that they actually don't, that the Netherlands is an incorporation space, right, for most of the capital that sort of flows in. And now BVI is also on that slide. Um, and fourth. It's sort of weird because this is made for Mac. All right, we'll keep going and I'll just keep telling you what's made up on slides. Um, another example of this, the most expensive case in UK legal history at the time was a litigation involving Calco, the Taji aluminum company uh, between uh, previous owners uh, and current owners moving in on this, 2004-2008, a battle over uh, management, accusations of embezzlement, uh, Talco management is incorporated in BVI, and the very complex intricate tolling arrangements that characterized uh, this place was sort of waged um, in London. And at the time, it was about 120 pounds of legal fees mostly paid for by the Tajik government. This is from our book. This is just an example of some of the tolling arrangements um, that Talco uh, has uh, uh, pioneered. So this involves uh, supply arrangements with the Norwegian company, uh, a management company that's registered in the BDI, uh, an investment company with links to a financing outfit in Tajikistan itself, um, and then uh, an actual investment company here in the U.S. <laughs> Finally, the myth of local tradition, right? We had a big debate in the late 1990s, early 2000s, about the importance of clans in Central Asian domestic politics, whether sort of clans were important, whether informal politics was important, what affiliations were there. But I think the part of this that we missed, and it's my very uh, not so skilled way of saying, I'm not going to tell you how I come out on that debate, but the part of this that we missed was the fact that global elites, whatever affiliation they had to their clan or informal network, also became global citizens at that point. In fact, I think what's more important for elite politics is not their kind of localism, it's actually the global spaces that they network, right, and operate in. How do Central Asian elites acquire global residency? Three main ways. First, they buy it, right? Um, this is not common practice through uh, buying, purchasing passports. St. Kitts and Nevis, for example, is a big source of Kazakh passports. Um, um, or they purchase it through residency uh, uh, investor uh, schemes. Uh, 
they operate in the diplomatic environment, right? They get diplomatic post, which gives them the right uh, political power, <laughs> or they apply for political asylum, right? And here you have sort of an interesting paradox in that um, when you have Central Asian elites who are fleeing the state or have turned opposition um, or are leaving, they are likely to get political asylum in a country like the U.S. or the U.K. or Australia based on the fact that, uh, by most accounts, these are authoritarian um, regimes. Um, so just an example this is from a company that sells citizenship very openly and has targeted Kazakhstan as one of their best clients. Right? Kazakhstan is another country from where the high net worth individuals have shown significant interest in making overseas investment. And so talks you through how they can do that with you. Um, this is data from the first uh, assessment of Tier 1 uh, visas that were granted in the UK right, for one million pound investments in the economy. And what you see, interestingly enough, half of them go to Russia and China, right, about a quarter of the total. Um, but six on the list is Kazakhstan. 41 Tier 1 investor visas granted in the UK uh, in that first batch. So, Central Asian authoritarian trends, we can talk about the problems of measurements and so forth. I'm not a great fan of sort of rankings, but I'll use them when they sort of fit my case here, shamelessly. <laughs> uh, but what we see is a general deterioration in the quality of individual civil liberties and freedoms over um, the 2000s. Tajikistan, Russia, Kazakhstan, Belarus, Azerbaijan, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan. Kyrgyzstan is the partial outlier here. Um, as it has uh, gone back and forth in this volatile political state. The rise of illiberalism and counter norms, that I think is another part of the piece. Um, Marlene will speak more to that, but I think you have counter norms like the emphasis on extremism and state security, civilizational diversity, the Shanghai cooperation, uh, and sort of traditional values, and a lot of these are mixed and matched in these new kind of national kinds of movements. Ukraine is an incredibly important turning point. Right? And here we normally see Ukraine as sort of a warning shot. Well, you know, this is where Russia declares its intent to intervene, right, using sort of, you know, its, its overseas military facilities. And surely Central Asian regimes will be concerned about this. And the answer is like, yes, you are certainly concerned if you are living in a capital city where you have 5,000 Russian troops stationed, right, at the potential for little green men sort of popping up. However, there's another existential security threat in Ukraine, which is the fear of the Maidan, the fear of popular street protests, foreign-funded or inspired, um, that will bring down the regime, and possibly even the fear of the connection. If you have street protests like Maidan, then you will get little green men who come in and sort of declare a referendum, right? So I think those have intensified uh, some of the dynamics. Eurasian approved Russian leadership. Actually, there's a lot of support for Russian leadership and so forth. What explains it? The media space, fewer colored revolutions, and the sense that Russia is the guardian of political stability. So I just want to briefly go through sort of the cases about another way of looking at globalizing Central Asian politics, um, political contestation. Um, that a lot of this is conducted along the lines of accusations of anti-money laundering. Right, so political opponents who flee are accused of having embezzled funds because, hey, if you were involved in Central Asian privatizations, certainly in the late 90s and 2000s, um, a lot of these deals uh, seem to have occurred um, in shifty or insider kinds of ways. Um, that's true of all of Eurasia. And a lot of them are flagged on Interpol read notices. But money, accusing someone of money laundering activates investigations into them by your regulatory counterparts in Switzerland, in the United States, in the UK, in Sweden. So who's in exile? Foreign regime, different types, foreign regime insiders, family members, members of opposition political parties, banned clerics, alleged religious extremists, and independent journalists, academic civil society activists, two prominent ones, former Kazakh prime minister, Geldin, and the son of uh, uh, President Kurma Bekbakiev, Maxim Bakiev, who now resides in the UK and has, um, uh, has political asylum. Um, we go through a kind of what we see a cycle of extraterritorial authoritarian uh, politics of being on notice to being arrested and detained to what's the end game when you're abroad, an extradition, um, um, an actual detention, a deportation, or possible action by uh, security services. So, 
when John and I started this project, we also wanted a practical aspect of this. So we initiated in 2014, and that's been taken over by a couple of research teams next to our Newcastle. Um, the Central Asian Political Exile Database, that lists um, about 160 uh, identified by public data, so there's no private info here. Uh, and what we found is the widespread and increasing use of ter extraterritorial security measures by all Central Asian states, but with more cases from Uzbekistan and Tajikistan. Here's the breakdown here. Uzbekistan 45, Tajikistan 53, <coughs> Kazakhstan 10, Kyrgyzstan 10, Turkmenistan 12. And you can find that and play around with it and scroll with it online. Abliyazov, I don't think I have time to get into it. To me, it's an absolutely fascinating case, right, for the Kazakh government. This is the case of chief uh, embezzler uh, in history, sort of allegedly took billions and billions of dollars from the BTA bank um, and then fled the country. Uh, Abliyasov himself and his political defenders say no, in fact he's been politically targeted. He is a uh, defender of uh, Kazakh democracy um, and a political um, uh, opponent. Um, he's actually been found in contempt by the UK High Court for not disclosing his, uh, uh, his assets, and while in exile, he allegedly supported opposition media and party organizations. Um, what's interesting about this is that in his, uh, there's a web of whole associates who have been, uh, based on these extraditions, um, arrested and picked up um, in these countries, and the pattern tends to be normally the same, whether it's security guard, his accountant, his political associate, so forth. They get picked up in Poland or Spain or, and so forth, and once a case gets to the high court level, um, it gets thrown out, uh, basically because of accusations of um, political motivation stick. I'll just point out the case of his daughter and his uh, wife who were abducted in, from Rome, from their uh, uh, house there, and uh, went over uh, to Kazakhstan on a private jet in what was later declared by a UN committee um, as um, an extraordinary rendition. So in December uh, last year, France's highest administrative court annulled Abliyasov's extradition uh, warrant that had been upheld by the French Prime Minister. And they said that this is politically abusive instrumentalization and told this is the first time since the Franco era that the French High Court has actually struck down an extradition uh, request. Uh, case here of Tajikistan, just here we have coded disappearances, renditions, attacks, assassinations. Just a couple things to point out. The spaces really are Russia for this extraterritorial cooperation, and um, Turkey, uh, and Ed Lemon, who's a postdoc at Columbia, is looking at sort of transnational security cooperation between Russian and Tajik authorities here. This is the fate of uh, Murali Kubatov, who himself went on sort of some global spaces, uh, head of an opposition group, and was shot dead in Istanbul, March 2015. Gulnara uh, Karimova, uh, that you know, indicated a series of telecom scandals, fate of those frozen assets are now subject to the bilateral. Oh, and in fact, I can finally now say on the record, because a Dutch prosecutor said it, that uh, in fact, Gulnara Karimova was the beneficial owner of Takalan, an offshore vehicle that was registered um, in Gibraltar. That was the intermediary for a lot of these pay-to-play sort of deals. So that's the scheme there for the Dutch prosecutors. So I'll just sort of skip over. Uh, purchases of really luxury real estate are really big um, by uh, all Central Asian elites. Um, some of them are quite colorful. Who owns 221B <laughs> Baker Street? Actually, a Kazakh oligarch used to, right? Vis a vis uh, a network of offshore companies. So let me just sort of wrap this up. What does this mean? So, uh, assumption of Central Asia as globally isolated is just flat out wrong, as far as I'm concerned, theoretically and empirically. Uh, after 25 years, Central Asia, Central Asian elites, and that's the operative word here are highly selectively globalized. And the contrast between the transnational networks of elites and the transnational networks of civil society, because that's how we normally think about transnational networks, is stark, right? Civil society is illegitimate, it's underfunded, it's viewed as a fifth column, it's hanging on by a thread, right? But elites themselves have robust transnational networks, right? And to get to sort of Larry's point, sort of setting this up, I think uh, an approach like this blurs traditional distinctions between domestic and foreign policy, but also between internal and external security, right? Where apparatuses of the state are used for very particular uh, uh, realms. The policy implications here, I can get into them in the Q&A. Basically, I think we have to just completely reconceive of the way we do democracy and governance. If you buy into this, and there's no reason you should, 
but democracy and governance has to stop being a thing that just happens within these spaces, right? And you have to train activists in the abuse of AML, in the abuse of um, uh, red notices. And also, we have to get our own house in order, and I can speak about that regarding real estate transparency laws, individual transparency, and all of these different elements that enable these transfers to take place. The very final one, we have a recommendation in there that public listed companies should make due diligence reports publicly available, right? So if you, if you have this sort of due diligence report saying that, yeah, that oh, sounds fine, you can do a hydro deal in Norway, this should be publicly available to, to see what the reasoning was um, and what the research was and so on. Okay, thanks. Thanks for the indulgence. Thank you.